Adi, good morning and welcome back to our Sunday School. Um, our Sunday School class, uh, as most of you are aware, is on critical race theory and it is an examination of critical race theory. We are examining it in two ways. We examined critical race theory in what it says, what it teaches. We wanted to understand this ideology before um, we were against it, you might say. Seems logical, doesn't it? Now, for the last, this will be our third week, our efforts are focusing on biblically examining this ideology. Our responsibility as believers is to test everything. We see that in uh, Second, Th no, First Thessalonians chapter five. Test everything. We see um, First John chapter four says, "Put the spirits to the test." Um, we are warned that there are people who will be literally. Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, ambassadors. Uh, of Satan who will masquerade as ambassadors of righteousness. So Satan has his people on the inside, you could say. And that's true because uh, Paul said in Acts 20 that to the Ephesian elders, he said, hey, I warned you with tears night and day for three years that after I leave, men from within your own ranks, among your own pastoral staffs, so to speak, will come in and they will distort the truth to draw disciples away after them. Um, it is not one single verse in the whole New Testament that tells us to be careful for false teachings. It, it, is, it has been said, I have read um, some commentators say that it is probably the most talked about issue in the entire New Testament, it's false teachers. What does that mean? It means that we need to pay attention and be careful because we have an enemy who wants to distort truth and distort, distort righteousness. Okay? It doesn't mean by simply saying that we need to be on guard that something that, uh, that critical race theory is therefore wrong. We have to find out biblically. We have seven issues with critical race theory that I've named. There could be more very, very easily, but these are, you might say, seven um, core issues. And is that the, the, is that Jim's guitar? There's a little bit of a humming going on. Oh, you got it. Okay, cool. Oh, that, ooh, just peaceful. That's awesome. They, I'm telling you, they should be paid. You're not getting paid. You're not getting paid, but you should be. And if you should be, go. <laughs> um, we need to, we need to be putting things we hear to the test, um, and we need to examine them. The seven things that we have looked at in critical race theory, or the, that we want to look at comparing the Bible to critical race theory, these are the seven points of conflict that I am focusing on for this class. Number one is foundations. We saw that last week. Uh, the video is up on the YouTube channel and the website if you want to go there and re-watch it. Today we're focusing on truth, the idea, the concept of truth, accessing truth. Is it even accessible? What is truth? Okay, defining that. Uh, sin, I have a problem with CRT. Biblically, we have a problem with CRT's idea of sin. Therefore, we also have a problem with CRT's idea of salvation. We have a massive problem with the CRT's idea of identity um, and the Great Commission and eschatology. So these are the seven points of conflict biblically that CRT presents, there could be more, but again, these are the ones I'm focusing on. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then uh, we're gonna start working our way through our PowerPoints. Father in heaven, may we take the truth once for all entrusted to the saints, and that includes us, we know, and guard it. Guard the good deposit, Paul told Timothy. And we as churches have a responsibility to know the truth and also a responsibility to know what is not true, that we might 
separate ourselves from it. Give us wisdom to see into these things. A lot of these things are milk, yet a lot of these things also are meat. We pray, Father, not only for a sense of urgency and a posture of defensiveness, uh, defending the, the faith, so to speak, but God, we pray also that in studying these things, our understanding of truth and of sound doctrine is more firm and more clearly grasped. That this isn't just about fighting what is wrong and what is unbiblical, but it is also about building up and establishing even better what we know to be true and right. Uh, so God, may we be edified in this way. Guard us from contentious spirits. Guard us, Father, from evil suspicions. Guard us from malice in our hearts. And rather, Father, may we have a great love for truth, a great love for you and your righteousness. And God, may this stir up within us hope uh, and obedience and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So truth. Uh, what is truth? How do you access truth? In other words, how do you come to know truth? And then lastly, mishandling scriptures, mishandling of God's truth. These are, uh, you might say, the three headings that we'll go under today, but what is truth? Very basically, what the Bible conceives of as truth, what the Bible presents to us as truth is different is a different concept than what CRT presents as truth. So the Bible, reality is whatever is. If you were to really boil down truth, right? It's whatever really is, independent of opinions. I can say that that wall is pink till, my, till I'm blue in the face. But what is the color of the wall? It is what it is, despite what I say of it. It's independent of my opinion and my perception, okay? That wall is what it is, what it really is. And so when we talk about what really is, whatever is true is, is, is whatever really is. It's that which exists. To say something exists that doesn't exist is, is a lie or delusional. Um, that which exists, exists the way that it exists. I know it's a little bit of a mouthful, maybe you're following just fine and it's just you, pastor, and it is me, it is, I read this stuff and I start to get cross-eyed, but that which exists, exists the way that it exists. In other words, it is what it is, regardless of anything outside of itself. Okay, what's ultimate reality? Actually, who is ultimate reality? God. When you say that God is real, you are saying that God is who he is, and that is utterly independent of what anyone says about him. He exists the way that he exists. If you want, you can go back to our, class, our, our sermon series from the summer when we talked about the attributes of God, and we looked at the, uh, we looked at the attribute of God's self-existence. In other words, he exists all by himself, what is his name that he gives to Moses so Moses can give to the Israelites? Go tell them that I am who I am. I will be who I will be, right? That's the name of God. That's Jehovah, the Yahweh. That's the all caps, right? The almighty Lord. You know, you read the preface to your Bibles in there. It'll explain to you how they translate and, and what the English wording is for Yahweh or Jehovah or that, 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 uh, that name in Hebrew of God. That's the name that means God is who he is. Okay? And that's the point. Reality is what reality is, regardless of what anything other than it says. And so here's the point. Statements are true. If you can see the bottom line there, statements are true insofar as they conform to the reality of which they speak. That wall is pink. The wall is not pink and my statement is false, okay? We had 600 people in church on Sunday. The reality is we had a, probably 100 or so and Justin, you're a liar trying to fluff your feathers, 
Okay? The Bible, what is truth? God is truth. God is unchanging. He is unchanging truth. His word is unchanging. And here's the key. This is where we're really going to dial down into the issue of CRT. God's meaning in his word is unchanging. What God said and what he meant by what he said, that hasn't changed. It has not changed. Does that seem ABCs to you guys? Like, well, yeah, it just kind of seems like a natural assumption when I pick up the Bible, right? Why would I think otherwise? You're, you're miles ahead of people who buy into CRT then. Because that point right there, God's meaning has changed. He doesn't always mean what he means. And we're going to get into that. Here's the thing, the very bottom line there you see. We have access to and we can understand absolute truth. God has communicated and he has communicated so that we can understand. Okay? CRT, what is truth? Under CRT, there are two ideas of truth. There is hegemony, which is whatever is said okay, by whoever has power. This is our tool, remember? This is our tool. Absolute truth, right? Let's say over here off to the side, absolute objective truth, okay? Man, man thinks that he can get that. CRT says, no, you can't. This is impossible for man. It might exist, but they're agnostic towards it. Nobody really knows what it is. What you're left with then is you're left with, what you're left with is you're left with a group of the oppressed and you're left with a group of oppressors and you're left with a bunch of subgroups of oppressed and a bunch of subgroups of oppressors. Name a subgroup of the oppressed. Women. Women. Name one more. Homosexuals. Yep. Those are oppressed. Name an oppressor group. White. Christians. Yep. So these are oppressor groups and oppressed groups. What are we saying? All of these groups have a view, right, of what they think is true. And what, 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 this, what CRT says is that hegemony is sort of like the all-pervading ideas about what's right, what should be normal, what should be, and what shouldn't be. This is, this is the cultural dominance over society that the oppressor group has over everyone in society and forces the oppressed to live with these ideas and these notions. Okay? So that's hegemony. Okay? It's the prevailing ideas of right and wrong, normal and abnormal, that the dominant culture, the dominant group uh, has over its cultural power over society. Okay? Then you have, so that's, that's, that's what they say. Well, that's what you think is true. Justin, you think that the Bible is absolute truth because that's just part of the hegemonic beliefs that you subscribe to. You don't really know that in reality, nobody knows what the Bible actually says. Okay? Justin, I know that you think that a marriage should be between one man and one woman biological man and biological woman, right? Cisgendered man, cisgendered woman. But that is just you living in your cis heteronormative patriarchal culture context and that's why you think that way. It's not because that is somehow absolutely true across all of humanity and all time and that, that somehow there's some overarching absolute objective reality that you are obligated to and that all people are obligated to. It's just your group thinks that way, so that's why you think that way. But there are other ways of thinking and other ways of seeing relationships, okay? So that's what the hegemonic view is. And then you have, then you have down here, CRT thinks therefore that real truth, real true truth is standpoint epistemology. Now we, we covered this in detail in previous classes, but basically it is whatever is said by whoever doesn't have power. 
In other words, the oppressed, remember we had this, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but we, we, we squirt those wheels. You wouldn't believe it. But it's like, it's Satan. <laughs> he dries it right up or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and someone's like, well, someone came to me a couple, couple months ago, and they're like, here, I'm gonna take care of that. We'll put it. I'm like, no, no, it's kind of like become our thing. It's like part of us. I wouldn't know what it would be if we didn't have it squeaking. So you have, you have right the center of society, and then you have way out here, you have way out here on the margins, okay, way out here on the margins where people live. There's no power, there's no voice. You're just like, you're just like subjugated to those who are in the center of society and who have all the power in society, okay? Well, what standpoint epistemology says is that these people on the margins are the ones who can really see the way things really are in society, okay? These are the people that because of their experience and run in with, with the dominant group and the hegemony that they've enforced over society, that these people on the margins, they have the ability to see what is really there. That's why their voices need to be centered. That's why you have DEI, that's why you have um, uh, diversity consultants, that's why you have racial reconciliation people brought onto your staff. To, that's the idea of diversifying the voices that are in the center so that decision making and power can then include people who aren't typically on the margins, but really it's about, it's about silencing white people, silencing people who are considered oppressors, forcing them into the margins so that it can be this swap and the margins can be in the center. Okay? What does all that mean? The idea of truth according to CRT is that the only people who can see what is true are the people who are oppressed on the margins. Their perspectives, their subjective experiences and perspectives that they have lived with okay, become the determiners and the definers of what is true and what everybody else has to accept as true. Okay? Has anybody ever been around anybody who had a perspective on something and they were just way off? Has anybody ever been around somebody who feels absolutely like they've been wronged and you're like, you know what, I don't think you're wrong. I think you're the one who's doing the, you ever been around somebody like that? Okay, it's brutal to be, to have to work with someone like that. Okay? Imagine a whole society operating on that ethic of people who are, who have these grievances, and, it, and, and then they know that in this type of society, all you have to do is claim a grievance, and you have automatically been given authority merely by the color of your skin or the orientation of your sexuality. What kind of empowerment does that make you feel like? Okay, so those are a little bit of a side issue, but the point, do you get the idea of where truth is coming from? Here's the thing, nobody, under CRT is subject to anything that is absolute. You can't say to somebody, well, well, you know, you keep telling me that you, you were pulled over because you're black, but you were doing eight miles an hour over the speed limit. Are you sure that it was because you're black or was it because, or was it because you were doing eight miles an hour over the speed limit in a, in a residential area, right? Or you're telling me, you, you know, you're telling me that that you didn't get that job because of systemic racism and, 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 and because you're black, are you sure that that's the reason why you didn't get the job or is it because there's somebody who was just better qualified? You know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons, but, but you're not allowed to ask that question. You're not allowed to say. So we just had uh, a guy just, I'm waiting for the narratives to just take off. Um, it's really sad that who's the guy that just died in Minneapolis? Some guy was just shot and killed by the cops. Amir, I think, Locke or something like that is his name. This poor guy got killed. I don't know what the story is. I don't know what all the facts are. But I guarantee there's already a narrative that's up and running and is gonna be shoved all over society. I guarantee it. Because nobody wants to wait for what actually happened and wait for the facts to find out what happened. They wanna get, they wanna use this guy's death as, uh, as a pawn to push uh, a broader narrative over society. This always happens. We, we talk about this in our pastor's group where, where something happens in society and it's a race to get way out in front of the facts. If you can get a narrative down the road, get society going with a narrative down the road far enough, pretty soon facts, when they finally come out, won't matter. They won't matter. They will have no effect on people's perspectives.
okay? And, th and this, is the, this is the thing here, is facts can't, facts no longer matter to people. And, and I, I've said this before, um, you've heard uh, people say facts don't care about your feelings. I'm saying, but that, that stops short of where we're at in society, okay? Feelings now are facts. They are the facts of all facts that determine everything in society. That's where we're at. That is a, we're in a dangerous, dangerous place if that's the case, okay? So what's true is just merely what I feel based on, based on my subjective experiences. Um, husband comes in and he wants to tell me, my wife's cheating on me. Okay, why, why do you believe that? That's horrible if that's happening. What's happening? You know, is that real? How do you know? I just feel it. I need more to go on than just my wife is cheating on me because you feel it, right? I need, I need you. So when I sit down in an office with somebody, and this happens over 12 years, something has happened and somebody's accusing someone else of something, I need more than just simply perspective. I remember somebody, you know, this is a long time ago and not part of our church, long time, I'm not mentioning names, but a guy was telling me, I remember at a potluck, you know, I looked over and so and so was just glaring at me. I'm like, so and so was glaring at you? I'm like, why? I don't know, but they just, I just got a vibe. It was a vibe. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, she's 78 years old. I don't think she can muster the brow muscles at this point to like, you know, I'm like, this woman is one of the sweetest, kindest women I've ever met. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's glaring at you. I'm like, were you being a jerk to her? No, I was just over there at the buffet table. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I need more than just your subjective experience and perspective, perception about what happened to believe that something happened the way you say it happened, right? But that's where we're at. That's where we're at. Okay, so truth. What is truth, CRT? Uh, so translation, truth is not objective and it is not to be discovered out there in reality. It is merely perception in our minds. Society is about which group's perception is going to be dominant. It is a struggle, a fight, and a battle for your perception to become the dominant one across society. That's what we're talking about. That's what this is all about, okay? This is a Darwinian struggle for power to be the dominant power in society. That's what this is, okay? So we've, and you've seen this, and I've written essays, you can get them on the website talking about this. That's why you see things like part of the oppressor's hegemony, ideas of truth, are things like objectivity, neutrality, merit, right? There's no such thing as you can treat people objectively. There's no such thing as treating people according to their merit, right? They reject all of that, okay? You do away with all. So let's just look at this, CRT, Samuel Perry, um, he's assistant professor of sociology and religious studies at the University of Oklahoma. He's the author of a book called Taking America Back for God. And I found this little jewel. I wasn't surprised to read this, but I still, still, I was just like, it's so obvious and it's so, such a pattern. You can't read this, but there it is. I was reading through his book or his, uh, his, um, this is a paper that he wrote, and this is like a professional peer-reviewed published paper. The Bible as a product of cultural power. Man, it just always comes back to the one word we keep talking about, right? The case of gender ideology in the English Standard Version. So this guy is a so-called Christian. He's a deconstructionist. He's a progressive. He doesn't believe um, the scriptures. He's, he's not evangelical. He's, he's scholastically got it out for evangelicalism and everything. So what does that say? So I'm, I'm, I wrote out the quote that's in there that you can't see. I propose that rather than approaching the Bible through a distinctly Protestant lens, okay, view, pay attention, sociologists, man, there they are again, should apply a Critical theory. Critical theory. That's what he's talking about. Critical theory means 
You criticize everything to try and expose and show how everything is about power and oppression. It's all it is. It's the same play every time. What does he say? We should apply a critical lens to reconceptualize the Bible more accurately. Well, I'm so glad that, that in Ephesians 4, verse, uh, what is it, 11? Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says, And he gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and sociologists so that we can apprehend truth. <laughs> the missing verse. Right? Thank you, sociologists, for showing us a more accurate conception of the Bible. Now, isn't it ironic that when they don't believe that there is any objective truth in reality, and most certainly not in the text, that he is coming around to say, you got it wrong, we got it right! You hypocrites! <laughs> not you guys, the sociologists! You say you can't apprehend objective, ultimate truth, but you're coming around saying that we got it wrong and you got it right, as though you're objectively true. Oh, man, I'm preaching. I got to preach. Next. Yeah, Mike. Darwinian struggle for power. Truth all. Well, because if you control the way people think and you control what they think is right and wrong, what they think is normal, what they think should be and shouldn't be, then you can begin, then that's one, that's one form of power. It's called cultural power. And one of the things that from the Frankfurt School back in the 30s, when those communist scholars came over to the United States, and they began writing, and they began something called critical theory, they began a long con, a long game of, we are going to begin to work our way through the institutions of, West, uh, of America, media, education, right? Um, um, what was the other one? Media, education, and universities. And we're gonna infiltrate them, and we're gonna try and turn the perspectives away from what America and Western society and biblically the people of this society think like, and we want them to begin to think in different ways. We want them to think that there is no truth. We want to think that everything is permissible. Break down the morality, break down the conception of reality, everything. And they want to just, dis they, it's why words like dismantle, you hear so much in this language, is because they're trying to dismantle all of society. And a lot of our society is built on the idea that things are true, and there are things that are not true, and all of that. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like they're, they're, in, they're, they're being intellectually dishonest and they're, um, you know, yeah, they're just, they're at their power and it doesn't have anything to do with the truth that they are. Correct. Well, some of them are liars, some of them are sincerely believing, and some of them sincerely believe the postmodern idea that there is no accessible absolute truth, that we, we can't really know. So every, all truth is local, meaning it's local to me and my group, and it's just my perspective of what's true. So then in order to eliminate the oppression in society, we have to tear down the oppressive system that's causing it. And so that's what it's really, it's what the whole cause is and the whole, you know, do the work is all about. It's, it's being an activist to break down and dismantle the system. So he goes on, watch this, Mike. That is, so this is his introduction, right? The Bible's contents, and not just their current interpretations, but also including their current interpretations, are highly contingent on temporal culture and power and being the product of manipulation by interpretive communities, that's us here, okay, and actors with vested interests. Did you catch that mouthful? Let me read it one more time, okay? The Bible's contents and not just the interpretation. That, in other words, what's on the pages of Scripture and the way we, the way, the conclusions we draw about what it says. They are highly contingent on temporal culture and power. It's always about power. And those things, the, the what's in the Bible and what we think the Bible means, they're all a product of manipulation by interpretive communities and actors with vested interests. Meaning that, th this is what they basically mean right here, Mike and everybody else. We believe the Bible is against homosexuality. And the reason we believe that 
is because we just come from a community that believes that and gains advantage from having that idea prevail in society. We maintain power as heteronormative people, okay, in society over LGBTQ people if we hold to that view. The only reason we hold to that view is so that we can maintain our power in society. That's the belief of Sam Perry and others, is that everything is about power and we only believe what we believe because we benefit from being the group that's in power in society. That's what this is all about. Now, the question you have to ask is, is well, what about his interpretive community? Don't you have a vested interest to gain power? So why is your power better than my power? Because based on watching people who don't have power and who are trying to get it, man, I don't want those people in power. We hear all the time from progressive deconstructionists. There are other valid ways of interpreting the scriptures. It's all, they say it all the time. There are multiple valid meanings of the text. No one way of interpreting is superior to the other, to any others. But they don't believe that. They say that, but they don't believe it. Okay? They believe the better interpretations come from oppressed perspectives. That those are better, or at the very least, they're, they're most closely aligned with what real reality is. James Cone, uh, the godfather of black liberation theology. I read his book, uh, uh, Cross and the Lynching Tree. I highly recommend you read it. He'll rip your heart out when he describes uh, the lynching era. And you need to have your heart ripped out about what that was like. However, he's a heretic. Look what he says about interpreting scripture. Look at what he says about how we read and understand the Bible. He says, black liberation theology, quote, <clears throat> as an interpretation of the Christian gospel, from the experience and perspectives and lives of people who are at the bottom of society, the lowest economic and racial groups. That would be which group? People in the center or people in the margins? Their perspectives will redefine the understanding of what the cross and what Jesus and what the Bible and what the church is all about. That's what he's saying. It's interpretation. Switch the foundation on which we interpret scripture. The cross and the lynching tree. He says in the intro, there is no one way in which the cross can be interpreted. I believe that the cross placed alongside the lynching tree can help us to see Jesus in America in a new light. I didn't automatically have a problem with that and very charitably in the introduction I was like you know what that's sort of riding a line James and you need to define what you mean by that I know what he means but I was trying to be charitable and say let's read on because that can mean something that that isn't heretical if he explains it more well he finally got around explaining it in page 155 and he just went full-blown heresy what did he say Rejecting the teaching of black and white churches that Jesus' death on the cross saved us from sin and that we too are called by him to suffer as he did, some black scholars, especially women, reject any celebration of Jesus' cross as a means of salvation. Theirs is a just and powerful critique of bad religion and theology. What is he saying? that our understanding of Jesus' cross. What is he saying about our understanding of Jesus' cross? Right or wrong? Wrong. Who needs to redefine our understanding of the cross? Okay. See the only one? Jim Wallace. Anybody know Jim? Jimmy James? Jim Wallace. Probably the guy who brought progressive liberation theology into the evangelical church more than anybody from the 70s on. We went over him last year a lot uh, in our previous classes. Cone's quote, Cone's, James Cone's Black Liberation the Theology, then uh, Gustavo, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez's Liberation Theology, that's the South American version, have opened up an understanding of God that is not controlled by who? White Western Men, do you see it? Who do they have a problem with controlling interpretation of the Bible? People they think are at the center of society and control all power. Therefore, they control the narrative. Therefore, they control what things mean in the Bible and what everyone else thinks that it means. And therefore, what he's saying is, hey, we had James Cone and Gutierrez, and they came along and they showed us a new way of seeing the Bible that isn't controlled by white Western men. 
What does he mean? It means the same thing Cohen means. The cross is not about Christ dying for our sins and we need to believe on him for personal salvation. Jim Wallace, Kristen Dumay, history pref, pref uh, blah, blah, blah. History professor, Calvin. Okay, anybody read her book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne? It's a huge hit right now. <clears throat> Deconstructionist. She says in a, in a, in a, uh, in a tweet thread, because she was in a thing with some evangelical guys who were pointing out her, her thoughts and her ideas. She says, quote, uh, it, that is her book, shows how history, culture, and experience shape what? Theology. Meaning, all understanding of theology is just local. Wherever you are, and whenever you are in history, and whatever your culture is, and whatever your personal experience is, that's what determines the way you think of what the Bible means. There's no objective meaning to the text. You just think there is. That's what that means. And then she full-blown goes on in that in her book and then in her, um, in her blog. Okay? Noteworthy from Schaefer. What we're seeing here is the idea of synthesis replacing antithesis. I want to read this from Schaefer. This, is, this, is, this guy's prophetic, man. He, when did he write? Like back in the 60s, for crying out loud? You think he was writing commentary on today? Did he die in 83? Well, he wrote this before that. So, where is it? Uh, page 14. Okay, here it is. So this is uh, the God who is there, right? And Schaefer, he says this. Um, he says, Hegel did not put this simply. His thinking and writing are complicated. But the conclusion is that all possible positions are relativized and leads to the concept that truth is to be sought in synthesis rather than antithesis. Meaning that there, there's no longer, there's no longer, remember we talked about antithesis last week? Where'd my marker go? Remember we talked about antithesis last week? Antithesis means that if something is true, its opposite is what? Not true. And what he's pointing out is that we've moved away from the idea of this antithesis and we've moved to synthesis. That means that things that are opposite can both be treated and thought of as true at the same time. Okay? God exists. God what? Doesn't exist. Can be true at the same time? Under the notion of synthesis, yeah. Yeah. God is one God, three persons, or God is not one God, three persons. Yep. What do you mean, yup? What is it? You can serve two masters, you can't serve two masters. What is it? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's all true. Because nothing's true, ultimately. It's just what you think. It's your cultural context. That's, that's what, he, that's what uh, uh, he is saying. And, he, and, and Schaefer goes on to say that what we have moved from in what the, what the philosophical thought and stream of thought over the centuries from the big thinkers really began to shift away from having... They, they really were trying to find this idea. How can we sum everything up? How can we find that with all the different things in existence, what is, what is it that brings them all together called the universal? What is the universal that, that sort of like ties all of reality together? And their philosophers were trying to find that and they couldn't. And then he says they finally just gave up on it. They finally just gave up on it, which he calls, he says, is anti-philosophy. So he says, philosophy today, and that is a radical, uh, he says, there's one basic agreement in almost all the chairs of philosophy today. That was the 60s and 70s he was saying this. And that is that a, there is a radical denial in all these chairs of philosophy, leaders of philosophy, there's a radical denial of the possibility of drawing a circle which will encompass all things. And in this sense, the philosophies of today can be called, in all seriousness, anti-philosophies. Because as philosophy, they have just walked away from the notion that we can somehow talk about all of reality as a universal sort of like coherent whole and tie everything individually within existence to that whole. You get, there's, they've walked away with it. What does it mean? It's balkanized the idea of reality. It's just broken reality up into a bunch of individual uh, existences. You've got this over here, you've got this over here, you've got this over here, but there's nothing that connects them. There's nothing that gives them a, 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 a coherent sort of like ultimate real reality that they're connected to and gives them meaning and, and connectedness with each other. There's just over there and over there and over there what do you have? 
When you have the postmodern view that there is no overarching absolute truth, what you have is you just have the black view of reality from based, uh, black people's views on, what, what time is it? I'm getting the clock thing. Is it, oh, we got plenty of time. We got like 15 minutes till church starts. So I'll just keep talking and then you come up and do announcements and then, I'll, and then we'll go right into the church. Service. See what I'm, let me make this point and then we'll wrap it up. When you, when you, when you basically balkanize everything, meaning you just break it up into a bunch of pieces that aren't connected, okay? When you do that, how do you make sense of this in relationship to everything else? You don't. Hold on one second, Mike. You can't. Your truth is just what you experience over here in your little island of reality that you exist in. White European men over here, right? Blacks, black females on the margins over here. This is the way CRT wants you to think. There's nothing that connects them, except they lie. There is something that connects them. What brings these groups together and gives them a unity? No. Under C yes, biblically. Under CRT, hi, I'm a black woman. I'm oppressed. Well, I'm not a black woman, but I'm a white transgender woman, and I'm oppressed. Well, I'm not a white transgender woman, but hey, I am a woman. I'm oppressed. You see? Variation, differences, distinctions, but what brings them all together? That's the new replacement philosophy in CRT. What brings them all together gather, and gives them all meaning, gives them all unity, is the, it always comes down to power. There, it's always their identity is based in how are you oppressed. Is that our identity biblically? That's coming up in two weeks, three weeks, so be careful. No, not be careful. Um, be here. That's what I meant. <laughs> Mike, I'll give you one question, buddy. Yes. So it's like the only way they can make them all agree is by destroying what they are. So Christianity is going to be accepted by those people. But it has to, of necessity, necessity be destroyed in what it is. So Mike is making the all important overarching point that when you say that everything is true and when you when if people are going to get together it destroys actually all of their individual identities and in, and on a level it really does and here's the fundamental level that it does especially with Christianity is if Christianity is not true and it's merely equally true with every other idea that floats around in the world there's nothing distinct really about Christianity it's just another true false idea. It's another idea that's considered true, but it's also equally false as much as any other idea. And so it destroys the distinctness of Christianity. Let me read this from John McCorder. He's a black atheist, progressive. He wrote against what's going on today with wokeism, and he says, it is a new religion. You have to think of CRT, wokeism, as a religion. It'll explain why, if your kids are getting caught up in it, this is why. He says, uh, this, this blew me away. I was reading this the other night. I'm like, oh my goodness. Why can't they allow other views? Remember, this is religion, not political science. And specifically, this is him. He's not a Christian. He's an atheist. And specifically, this is a religion eerily akin to devout Christianity. Okay, he, he makes some swipes at Christianity. He's going to. That's fine. But that on his outside observation, seeing it, really what he's saying is as a cult of Christianity, his perspective and what he's seeing as a non-Christian. Think about that. Okay, think about that. It explains why so many Christians buy into it because it's a cult and they think it is somehow Christian or a better version of Christianity. Okay, let's pray. Father, Jesus is our truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and we have come to him, and through him, Father, we have come to you. There is no other way to you but through Jesus Christ, your son. God, it is not another Jesus that we follow. Let us not be seduced uh, by the teachings of this world and the ideas of this age, but God, let us uh, prevail in persevering. Uh, Lord, knowing that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world, knowing that, that, that Jesus, though the world may bring trouble, 
that he has overcome the world. May we remember that, that your purposes stand and they will not be defeated because you are God and you are seated on your throne. May we worship you today, God. May our service today bring glory to your name, we pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, see you next week.